Before we get to the point where you create your own innovations, your own digital innovations, which is what I'm actually really looking for, let me walk through some of the things that we've already seen, like the innovations that already happened, to just to get a feel for that game. Here we have our 21 different building blocks, and as I said, there are also many more. This is just to get us going. There are also not as many as Edison had, but probably in the digital realms there are there are many more building blocks that you can combine. And from the combinatorial possibilities, N choose K, you already know how many you can get out of that. So here, let's just start with choosing two out of, of the 21 and see something that was maybe the first convincing argument why digital technology is something really useful. When I started to work in this field in the, in the late 1990s, around the year 2000, I did my first research and I started at at the United Nations Secretariat, and, and I said, hey, you know, this digital thing is really interesting. I did an internship there. And they actually let the intern take over the topic because nobody was really interested in this topic. Uh, the argument was that I heard more than once is that, why do we care about that? People cannot eat computers. You will not solve poverty with whatever that thing is. But the first argument when people started to understand, well, there might be more than meets the eye. Maybe these computers are not made to be eaten, um, <laughs> was when people realized, well, it really reduces transaction costs. Transaction cost is something fundamental. And transaction cost is not something only economical. You think about transaction cost, a coordination cost in a social, in a, in a democracy. Coordination costs are transaction costs. We're transacting opinions, for example. So think about it that way. The death of distance and timeless time are very important uh, for that. Here, that's a study back from these days, the late 1990s, and there was, was almost no research out there. I mean, the internet just came about, mobile phones weren't around, but this graph really hit home. I showed it to my boss, and I think that's when my boss started to understand, um, oh, wow, that's something we might want to research. They still left it with this intern, which was very entertaining for me, but so let, let, me walk through, let me walk through that graph. So if you go into a bank and do a transaction, you go to the bank teller, it costs the bank mo about more than a dollar. The transaction cost costs more than a dollar because, well, they have to have a building. They have to pay rent for this building or have to build this building. They have to clean this building. They have to put furnishes into this building. They have to put a person into this building. They have to pay salary and health insurance for that person. And they have to, so they, they have to pay the air condition. So if you just then average it out, how much it actually costs to execute one transaction while you walk into the bank, it's, it's more than a dollar. You do it on the phone, it's, it's half of that, and an ATM even less, but you do it on the internet, it's a cent. So when they saw this, you know, the powers to be at the United Nations, they started to understand like, whoa, that is uh, something, something very interesting we have to look at. And after that, after that, of course, came the flood. A lot of digital products followed basically this incentive the combination of the death of distance and the timeless time, because now you could transact through a distance and timeless time in real time or asynchronically as well. Please go back to the previous session and, and, and look up if, if you don't have it ready yet, what these concepts refer to the death of distance and timeless time. So you could do it asynchronically. You can do an online transaction at three o'clock in the morning. You don't need a bank teller to be there and you can do it across the globe. You don't have to travel over there and it, it, it goes in real time. So it can synchronically, asynchronically over large distances. And all of these are basic transactions, including lectures here. We are death of distance, you know, and, uh, and time this time, synchronically. I don't know what time it is right now uh, when, you, when you consume this lecture and you can consume it again as well. You can go right now back and watch the same thing in double speed. If you can handle my voice in double speed, I'm not sure about that. This transaction cost reduction is possible when we have an information product. Because if we have an information product, be it an airline ticket or a recorded lecture or a movie or a newspaper or some kind of shopping transaction, we can put it into digital networks. So there's a death of distance and the timeless time. And that leads to these brutal uh, transaction cost reductions that at the end affect the entire economy. I and mean, you already saw that little slide where we have all these transactions that go on inside the company, inside the enterprise resource planning, the supply chain management, the customer relationship management, and you know, 
all of that, of course, and they're all affected by transaction costs. And that actually, this reduction of the transaction cost, thanks to the death of distance and the timeless time, reorganizes the entire economy to a degree. And there's a very famous theory that explains that. And surprise, surprise, it's called the transaction cost theory. It's actually one of the only, I'm a, one of the few must have been, or maybe one of the only uh, theories uh, that received two Nobel Prizes, Coase in 1991 and Williamson in 2009. And what transaction cost theory basically a nutshell says is that the optimal size of an organization such as a firm, depends on if internal transaction costs are smaller or larger than external transaction costs. And that applies actually to the size of every organization. That's an interesting question. What's the perfect size for my NGO? Should we grow? Should we become a bigger organization? Uh, or should we become a smaller organization? Uh, what's the perfect size for my company? Should we grow? Should we shrink? And why do different organizations in society have actually different kind of sizes. Well, what transaction cost theory, the Nobel Prize crown transaction cost theory, double Nobel Prize crown transaction cost theory will tell you is that it depends on the transaction cost. So if internal transaction costs are very high, for example, if it costs me a lot to supervise somebody internally or to train somebody or if it costs me a lot to rent a space internally for the company more than external transaction costs if it would be cheaper to outsource it then i outsource it hence my organization shrinks now if external transaction costs become bigger for example if i don't have enough control of what these people are doing over there and my outsourced offshore i don't know where they are and actually doesn't really work um, or communication costs would be very expensive and i have to travel there all the time then i would insource it i would just purchase that thing i would purchase the competitor or, or, or somebody or somebody in my before in my supply chain i would purchase somebody on this end or on that end and my company would become bigger. So it depends on if the internal transaction costs, how I, with the costs of how I organize things internally, basically speaking, is smaller or larger than my external transaction costs. I hope that makes sense. And we're not gonna make an economic study out of that. That's where we, we leave it. I hope that makes sense and that's, that's how far. But you can already see with that, then obviously, if I now do a lot of video conferencing, it becomes cheaper. I can communicate with people on the other place. It's cheaper for me to supervise them. And also the internal transaction costs. If I do home office, then I don't have to rent so much space in order to employ more people. So the internal transaction costs get reduced. I might hire more people. And I don't even need to purchase an office space. But also my external transaction costs get reduced because now I can video conference with people on the other side of planet Earth and I just might outsource. So do companies actually become bigger or smaller? or with the digital revolution? It's an interesting question. And the truth is some become bigger or some become smaller. I mean, the, what you usually think about is, well, they become smaller because now everybody's more agile, everybody is more, can more coordinate in the network and you cut out the middleman. So these middlemen that hold on, hold the control, you can cut them out. And one of the one of the seminal studies from from very early on, from 2007, um, showed this in a very interesting case in a rural village in India. And it was it was a beautiful quasi experiment. So the researchers went there in the late 90s when they didn't have any mobile phone, and people were quite poor. Uh, you know, fishing is a dangerous, quite poor. Poverty has to do with security. Uh, it's dangerous to go out in the sea. You don't get a lot. You don't get enough to, to maintain your family and, and you, enough to sell in order then to purchase other things like medicine and, and education and other things. So it's a spiral that was, well, was very hard. But then they came back five years later in the year 2001. And the only thing that really changed and it's beautifully shown in the study is that now they had mobile phone. And as Confucius would say, if you want to take somebody out of poverty, don't give him a fish, teach him how to fish. So the mobile phones allowed them to teach themselves how to fish because now they could connect to the weather service and they could say like, oh, hey, your store is, storm is brewing up there. Let's don't go out there. Otherwise, you know, we might get hurt. So health increase, that's a big 
aspect of poverty. Security increase. They could also see somebody would say like, whoa, there are a lot of fish over here, guys. Come all over here. We, we go there. They, they increase productivity. They could all call to also call to the market and coordinate supply and demand and say from the market, okay, so what's missing? Well, what's missing is this kind of, okay, so let's all go for this kind of fish. They could increase the income and cut out the middleman. You know, the guy that came from the city, from the marketplace, and would tell them more or less the truth of what's actually going on, they would cut them out and they could actually increase, uh, yeah, increase, get themselves, lift themselves out of poverty thanks to communication and information processes. So transaction costs, coordination costs among them got reduced and from them with the market got reduced. So that would argue, so now we don't need these big conglomerates. We have all these little agile agents that can coordinate in a loose digital network. So wouldn't then, you know, the optimal, orga the optimal, optimal organization of a digital society be many small different nodes that hang together in a network being digitally communicated. Well, yeah, could be. Let's look at another example, the sharing economy. Obviously there we have the same thing, death of distance and timeless time. You and me can become a service provider now by renting out our beds, literally renting out our beds uh, through, through different sharing economy business models or you know, driving taxis. So we don't really need anymore these big conglomerates that buy a hundred taxis and then it's a big company that owns the taxis. Like, you know, I can drive taxi with my own car that I own myself. Uber doesn't owe it. The right service, the right sharing service doesn't own it. So the sharing economy makes, takes advantage of this coordination. So the days of distance, the timeless time, they coordinate, coordinate us in this loose network. But then again, what also happens? Is it true that they are no more big conglomerate companies. Well, what they did at the same time is they took advantage of the digital footprint and they started to coordinate up here on the platform, calculating some what if scenarios, introducing a lot of programmability. And what you do here on this information platform actually, yeah, I mean, Airbnb is the biggest provider of beds on, you know, bigger than the Hyatt and the Sheraton together. And Uber is bigger than, you know, any, any taxi provider without actually owning one single taxi, really. Uh, you own an Airbnb doesn't really own the beds, but they create a platform up here. So some other, what happened here is some other digital trades came in and created a completely new structure in society. You see, now we have a lot of small agents, the reduced transaction cost, but then reduced transaction cost internally, there's reduced transaction cost and reduced transaction cost internally, which has to do with the data and how they process the data. They do some very expensive computations of calculating what if scenarios. That's why sometimes when you call a ride share, it's much more expensive because there is not enough supply of drivers and there's a high demand. Supply and demand adjust in real time. Back in the days when you call a taxi, you would exactly know what the mile costs. Now not. There's a lot of calculations going on and they can do that because they really have an idea about supply and demand uh, you know, of that market and it becomes efficient. So six o'clock in the morning, the driver still is drinking her coffee, but then she says, hey, I get three times the money. Let's get out right now and drive a few rounds and supply and demand coordinate themselves. And they can do that because they have internal transaction cost of processing all that amount of data and computing it thanks to the digital footprint they are collecting. So here we have now a big company emerging and many small companies here loosely in the network. So we have a combination now of some digital trades moving towards one innovation in society, little small agents, and some other digital trades pushing the other way, creating some big agents. And we can continue that with adding some some uh, additional character, uh, some additional traits and characteristics here, the polydirectionality and the network structure, if you combine that, you end up with crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing is the idea that uh, we take advantage of this network structure. Instead also of coordinate people with assets, we just really, we just network people. And there are platforms like Amazon Turk or many freelancer platforms, freelancer.com, Fiverr, Upwork, which these platforms are the size of the ton, uh, top 10 economies in terms of labor force. So if you take top 10 economy, it would be a top 10 economy, these platforms, uh, with regard to the amount of employees that they have 
basically working through them and working on their platform. And they are also very productive. Uh, these polydirectionality of the, of the networks, how you can coordinate with different people, one-to-one, many-to-one. So for example, many-to-one, Netflix, how Netflix before Netflix was really big, it had the idea of this recommender algorithm. It, and you know about that from our, on, on our session when we talked about social media, how these things work. They're extremely powerful and they are the secret sauce of many of these services, including Netflix. They know what you would like to watch next. Now, how they came up with this recommend algorithm is through crowdsourcing. They took advantage of reaching out to many people and they organized a competition through a platform called Kaggle. And they said, you get a million dollars if you can improve our prediction algorithm that predicts what people would like to watch next. And that was back in the year 2007, eight and nine, and the rest is history. I mean, back in those days, Hollywood was still laughing about Netflix and the, you know, the big production studios. Now, you know, they're all running behind it and would like to run a Netflix because Netflix knows you know, what people would like to watch. And they did that by reaching out and, and reaching out to a big pool of people that then communicated many to one the solution of how to increase that. And others do that as well. Even NASA, <laughs> even the advanced NASA uses these kind of crowdsourcing network structures in order to find somebody who can solve the problem. For example, one of the problems in NASA is how to measure the shape of galaxies. And they put a lot of resources in trying to how to shape the how to measure the shape of galaxies. And they just put it up. And it turned up that a young PhD student in glacier mapping created a solution that outperforms NASA algorithm in the first week. <laughs> so you can now reach out and you can crowdsource the knowledge um, towards you. Now again, that gives many small agents like this PhD student or the ones that won the Netflix, Netflix prize, they won a million dollars, great for them, but it's still cheaper than, I mean, how many engineers can you employ for a million dollars? And how many could you evolve, involve in a competition like that? And this is thanks to the network structure and the polydirectionality of these digital networks. But again, it creates a structure. We have many small agents and then some big platforms, which is kind of like a different structure. Now, one thing that fortifies that is now we add machine learning and the scalable modularity. Scalable modularity, now that you know what innovation is, you know, that's basically new combinations applied to code. That's how you could think about scalable modularity. Uh, you just write a piece of code and you leave the piece of code and then you recombine it for, for new things. And for machine learning, it's also you have, you can recombine once you learn something, you, you, you train the machine and then you can use it again. And that also creates a different dynamic. Machine learning can be incredibly expensive, incredibly expensive. You really, that's why only the real big companies go into the serious machine learning because you need big data sets and very energy costly as well, running these uh, computations to train the machines. So now we have the crowdsourcing, sharing economy with many small agents, but now some centralized big platforms provide a service with artificial intelligence that leads to the augmented intelligence. And I'm not going to go again to ChatGPT and some of the cool new applications that have come out more recently. I go to something that's actually very per pervasive in the economy already. For example, Google Maps, that's an augmented intelligence. That's how you can think about that. You use the digital footprint and Google Maps knows what's going on right now in real time. Uh, the digital footprints they get basically from, from mobile phones. When a mobile phone moves at a certain speed across a road, they imagine there's a car around it. And that's how you can then see if there are traffic jams and what there is because phones are tracked. And then you have a digital footprint and that's the augmented intelligence. I mean, now I augment my intelligence, same as I augment my intelligence with these extensions uh, of my capabilities. Now I do that with Google Maps and I can look ahead. There's a really cool glasses. Huh? I can see how the traffic is, is building up 20 miles ahead of me. And uh, you can have augmented intelligence also in real time business models for, for, for many years. For example, when you call your call center of choice, sure you have one, you usually hear this line, right? This call might be recorded for quality and training purposes. And you always imagine there's the head of HR of human resources listening in to make sure that you are treated well. Otherwise, she will talk with her employees and 
uh, no, <laughs> the, the head of HR would have a lot of things to listen to if they would listen to your talk. So what it's usually, it's a few million algorithms that listen to you while you talk and while you talk, they classify you into different boxes by the way you talk. And that's like in more than half of the call centers I've been told already for several years. And these boxes are defined actually, that's a process developed by NASA many years ago. Uh, they developed this process when they were thinking about how to make sure that people get along when they're in space, how astronauts get along when they're in space. Because they had some space homicides almost, you know, all these alpha males couldn't get along. And they're like, how can we find out how people actually get along? And it turned out that this researcher here, Carla, he, he figured out it's the way people talk gives away something about what motivates them. And that allows us to see who really gets along. And so you use this very old model that's public knowledge. You have a lot of language. You put the machine learning source on top and you classify people in these different boxes. So a third of us is emotion driven, a quarter of us is thoughts driven, some of us are actions driven. Now it depends. So for example, yes, I, I think I'm certainly also actions driven. Like if I wouldn't have my phone for two days, uh, you know, I'm calling the call center and I don't have the time. I'm like, okay, so look, guys, that wasn't comfortable. What can you do for me? Do you reduce my bill or you give me a coupon? What do you want? Now, my partner, on the other hand, you know, that's why I love her so much because she is, she compliments me completely on the other end. So she would not really be motivated by, by, by these kind of actions. But if the call center really understands her and she understands how actually how difficult it was for a few days without a phone and what was going on, she would come back to me and say like, you know what, this company is great. They completely understood me, they connected. They, we, we should never change that, that mobile phone provider, right? They, it's really a great company. So that's how we complement each other a, a little bit. And that's how you get along in a relationship. Uh, however, if you call in a call center, you usually want to be matched up with those that speak the same language as you. You don't need somebody who compliments you. You need somebody who resolves the things quickly. So what they do is they have these algorithms listening to you while you talk, and then they take somebody from the call center that has the same personality traits as you and they match you up with them, right? And then you talk with a person who, who really gets along with you. Now, the person on the other line also really doesn't know that, <laughs> right? They just match you with them. I, I had a student recently then talking to the call center like, hey, I knew you matched me. And, and the other, the, other, the person on the other side was like, I, I don't know what's going on here. I'm also just emotions driven. I'm like, no, I don't know. But so it's the, the ones on the other side, they also don't know, right? It's the algorithms. Like there's nobody home. The algorithms have the power. They match you up. Uh, and then, you know, you really get somebody who speaks the same language, which is good for business, maybe. For, for relationships, you want something else, but for business, it's great and you can solve it and, and the outcomes are impressive. Call duration is cut by half and customer satisfaction is doubled. Now tell that to your boss. You, you cut cost by half while you double productivity. How crazy is that? Well, thanks to just this trick and, and that's a very powerful magic sauce. Now, once you have that, you have all these different modules once you figure that out and now you can apply it to different services. Right, so these call centers who have this magic sauce, who have this software, now they can grow and they can have also programmability with it. So they can keep on going and expanding, making it actually better. So right now, they, well, in most of the case, they just match up to people. But, you know, you can also some more advanced applications. They, the AI suddenly jumps in and tells the person on the call center like, hey, now it's time to hand out the coupon. So once you program it, you can better manage these kind of services. Now, this is again, a business model for a bigger organization. So summing up, some digital innovations can actually counter balance or even cancel out other digital innovations. And we keep on creating a completely brave new world. What we've seen here, we start out with transaction costs that reduce the transaction costs. Then we added the crowdsourcing sharing economy on top. And then we created the augmented intelligence on centralized platform that actually implements a sharing economy that is centrally orchestrated. <laughs> well, that's how new combinations lead to innovations, which lead to a creative destruction in society. That's a technical term to describe innovations. Our innovations, which lead to new combinations in society, enhance collectively 
We reinvent the future.